This is Europe and the United States in the 20th century, and we are on lecture number nine, the United States and European decolonization. So in today's class, we are going to be considering some of the events that were happening beyond Europe. So a slight refocus. So we're thinking in terms of out of area issues. But nonetheless, we're looking at these through the frame of the transatlantic relationship. And as the title of the lecture suggests, we are going to we are particularly interested in thinking about European decolonization. And I suppose I suppose there are well one question which I want to address is the extent to which the United States actually influenced the way the Europeans went about dismantling their various overseas possessions uh, after the end of the Second World War. Um, and a second related question is the extent to which the Cold War um, and Cold War considerations also influenced this process. Okay, um, this slide here. Um, by way of introduction, um, we need to consider the, the various overseas interests, overseas possessions, sorry, that the various Europeans had. And for some reason, my slide seems to be slipping. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, we'll go back to the right page again. Um, first of all, it's necessary to say that end of the Second World War, um, there are several European countries which had overseas empires. Um, the country which had the biggest empire was Britain. Um, and as the point there suggests, you know, Britain's empire basically gave it a plausible claim to great power status. In fact, when you think about the various uh, attributes that, um, you know, that a great power needed to have, Overseas possessions or colonies, historically or traditionally, had been one of the attributes that they had tended to focus on. So Britain had the world's biggest empire, an empire upon which the sun never set, the British proudly like to claim. Um, France had the second largest empire, a French empire mainly located in North Africa, bits of the Caribbean as well, obviously. Um, the Near East, Syria notably, um, and of course Southeast Asia um, in the shape of uh, Indochina. Um, and there are a few others as well. Uh, Belgium was still in possession of the Congo. Um, Portugal had, had uh, one or two colonies in Southern Africa. Uh, Angola, today's Angola and Mozambique. Um, the Dutch still were in possession of the Dutch East Indies. Um, Italy, of course, lost its colonial possessions at the end of the Second World War, so they had no choice. They were diver divested of their empire, being on the losing side. Similar situation for Japan in East Asia once the war comes to an end. So those on the losing side had little choice but to give up their colonies. Germany, of course, lost its colonies at the end of the First World War, so it had no colonies to lose at the end of, at the, end of the Second World War. But as I say, a number of Europeans still were in possession of the overseas empire. And I think it's fair to say that the Europeans in 1945 had no real intention of dismantling their empires. In fact, as, you know, as I said at the beginning, um, for the Europeans, their empires were, were considered to be a possible resource upon which they could draw, um, which might lead them again to become major players on the international scene. I think Britain's Foreign Secretary, I've lost the quotation, unfortunately, otherwise I'll, I would uh, 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 um, cite it fully. Uh, but uh, Britain's Foreign Secretary and the Labour government uh, that uh, uh, that comes to power uh, after the war in Europe ends. Um, Britain's Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan says something along the lines of that, you know, the empire was basically going to be a route back to great power status to the point at which Britain might actually again uh, be some kind of uh, um, um, 
Britain might again have some sort of status of equality with the United States. So as I say, the empire was seen as an important resource um, in 1945. But of course, when we look at what happens subsequently, um, the pattern that, that comes to the fore is that one by one, the various uh, European uh, countries go about dismantling the empires. Some go about that business more willingly than others. Some start earlier than others. But nonetheless, you know, by the end of the 60s, certainly by the mid 1970s, um, the European overseas uh, empires have been pretty much liquidated. And as I say, I make, I've forgotten I had this on the, on, on, the, on the next slide. So yes, it really recapitulates uh, some of the points I just made about, uh, yeah, about the various Europeans. OK, we will move on to the next slide. So when considering the various reasons for European decolonization, I tend to group them, in my own mind at least, I tend to group them into two sets of reasons. The first, as this slide here says, I think there are, were material reasons for European decolonization. These largely rooted in the sort of economic consequences of the Second World War. But I think there are also non-material reasons which historians have pointed to, to have pointed to. To some extent, it's kind of difficult to separate the two categories, but I think they are sort of worth uh, worth noting. OK, the material reasons. The material reasons, I think, are the most are, are, are the more obvious. And as I say, kind of rooted, I suppose, in European economic weakness. So point of war over European powers, you know, we've discussed this before in terms of the sort of economic consequence of the Second World War, all the European powers had been significantly weakened economically with the with the, with the Second World War. Um, which was obviously going to make it difficult for the European powers, the British, the French, um, especially, I think, to kind of reassert their control over various colonies. Um, a second related reason, though, is that the war itself actually encourages economic development in some of the colonies. Um, so you begin to see the, see the, if you like, see the beginnings of the process of industrialization and modernization taking place in some in in some colonies. Uh, essentially, you know, as the Europeans draw upon their colonies in terms of their war economy. Um, factories are constructed in some colonies in order to provide the Europeans for the necessary sort of materials that they need to fight the war. Um, I don't want to exaggerate. Uh, as, as I say, it is merely the beginnings. But in some of the more economically um, advanced colonies, notably, I think, in India, you do see this. Um, and that is sort of significant because, as we know, industrialization, modernization, that has very profound uh, consequences in terms of society's social structures. So you see the beginnings of a working class. You see even the beginnings of an emerging indigenous middle class. Um, again, I don't want to exaggerate. In the case of India, we're talking about a tiny percentage of the overall population. But of course, when you look at the various sort of nationalist leaders that emerge after the Second World War, you know, they are if you like, the educated indigenous elite. So people like Gandhi in India, you know, he'd start, he'd, he was basically a trained lawyer. He had studied at London Inns of Court. Nehru, the first Indian prime minister, uh, had, uh, you know, studied at Oxford. So as I say, you know, the war has sort of profound, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, economic modernization has quite profound consequences in terms of uh, uh, the, you know, the colony's social structures. Furthermore, the war sort of had stirred nationalist and communist movements in the in the in the colonies. I, that sort of relates to um, more to the ideational side, which I'll come on to now. Um, and, you know, final point, imperial policing in far flung corners of the world proved extremely difficult. So as the British were beginning to face mounting unrest in India, say, uh, because of their econ you know, because of their economic, uh, you know, relative economic weakness, they were finding it rather difficult to sort of contain these, uh, uh, contain this sort of disorder, this sort of unrest. Okay, let's consider some of the non-material reasons. As I say, it's quite difficult to sort of separate the two. Um, 
The first point, and it sort of relates back to the previous slide where I talk about the war stirring nationalist and communist movements, um, but the ideological nature of the war itself also undermines imperialism. Um, essentially, you know, the war itself is an ideological struggle between three um, ideological worldviews, if you like. You've got Nazism, stroke fascism in one corner, communism in the other, and capitalism and liberal democracy in, 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 in the third. Um, and obviously, you know, the allies are claiming to be fighting for self-determination, democracy, freedom, things like that. Hard to square this with maintaining an overseas empire. And, you know, documents like the Atlantic Charter, which are produced during the Second World War, uh, you know, are promising these sorts of things, promising these sorts of values. Now, when Churchill signs the Atlantic Charter, you know, he's quite clear in his mind that this that the charter will apply solely to Europe. You know, he doesn't think it's going to apply to Africa or Asia or places like that. Um, on the other hand, the Americans have a rather different view, you know, when Roosevelt sits down and, and signs it. And of course, you know, the dog, the Atlantic Charter itself. Um, um, the actual values it contains and things like that sort of spread into the uh, you know spread into the kind of in, 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 into the colonies um so the message within it is certainly not lost on nationalist leaders in various colonies then you've got the spread of liberal ideas into the colonies um so if you like european ideologies uh, begin to kind of make their mark in various colonies this would, you know, this would have been a sort of long running process, but arguably the war accelerates this. Eric Hobsbawm in his book, you know, he gives the example uh, that public buildings in French, uh, in French colonies were often inscribed with the revolutionary slogan, liberty, equality and fraternity. Um, and of course, you know, indigenous people within the colonies, at least some of them, those who perhaps were somewhat literate, uh, could read that slogan and ask themselves, you know, what did that mean for me? Similarly, another European idea, communism, increasingly makes itself felt in 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 in, part, in several kind of European overseas empires, especially in China, especially in 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 Asia. And then you got the implied opposition of the United States, also weakening empires. So you have this kind of combination taking place. Yes, there's European weakness, European economic weakness coming at a time when, as I say, these European ideas are also beginning to spread in their colonies and you have indigenous leaders increasingly sort of adopting uh, or embracing these sorts of ideologies, whether it's self-determination, communism, nationalism, things like that. It's no accident that it's the most ad economically advanced colonies which are the first to achieve independence simply because, you know, they're the colonies which actually have um you know a small educated indigenous elite which could kind of embrace this those which were, were, were much less developed somewhere like the congo in central africa um belgium holds on holds on to the onto the congo until the 1960s um simply because you know there were very few people there who were who were in a position if you like in terms of education and all the rest of it who were in a position to seriously challenge belgium's rule in that particular in that particular colony. Um, then you've got the anti-colonialism anti of the United States, which obviously was a very long tradition. I'm not going to uh, kind of recapitulate this now, but we talked a little bit about um, the relationship between the United States and imperialism and empire. Um, you know, one of the points I made previously is that the United States doesn't really need to have an overseas empire simply because it's it's in control. You know, it, it is in itself a sort of continental empire. Um, insofar that it does have, have an empire, it, as I say, the final point that it tended to um, control its near abroad. So if you like the Western Hemisphere, tended to exert its influence indirectly. One of my favourite quotations is from Franklin Delano Roosevelt talking about Trujillo, who was a pretty unpleasant authoritarian leader in the Dominican Republic. He's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, Roosevelt famously uh, uh, said, beginning, if you like, a kind of long and less than noble tradition 
in American foreign policy or supporting various sort of authoritarian leaders in the Western Hemisphere and beyond, of course, um, if it suited American interests. Uh, again, I'm staying with this sort of US and imperialism in the in the 20th century. In this slide, again, I'm going to pass over this because we've talked about Wilson and the mandates of Versailles. Um, but yeah, notionally, as part of American identity, the Americans do not support colonialism. And this becomes a source of contention between the United States and the British during the war. And we will come back to that in a moment. OK, let's talk a little bit about um, the British. Uh, we have a map here of the British Empire in 1914. It should be said this is not the zenith of the British Empire. Britain gains a clutch of new colonies immediately after the First World War, especially in the Middle East, including Palestine. And boy, what a poison chalice that was. Um, so Britain's, if you like, the sort of maximum extent of the British Empire, sort of geographically, its zenith, if you like, is in the early 1920s. Thereafter, you get a sense that the British are in retreat. In fact, the British are basically experiencing something of a crisis in empire even before the Second World War. Um, so I would argue that the Second World War perhaps sort of accelerates the process of decolonization. Uh, um, but nonetheless, you know, the British, the British were basically basically experiencing a pretty acute um, situation of strategic overstretch even before the Second World War breaks out. So almost inevitably, I would argue that the British would have had to undertake decolonization in some kind of fashion, even had the war not actually intervened. Um, OK, just a couple of observations about the British Empire. First of all, it's important to make the distinction between the white dominions. So that's Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and you could lump South Africa there in terms of the white governing elite. Um, and yeah, these are self these were self-governing colonies. In fact, you know, late 19th century through the 20th century, um, you know, these colon these dominions, as they were described, basically become self-government. You know, there's a growing recognition in the 20s and 30s that that that, that these uh, that the dominions uh, were ultimately going to be in charge of their own destiny. Um, you also, of course, have Ireland or Southern Ireland, I should say, which is granted dominion status um, after the First World War. That's a very long and complicated story. But essentially, Ireland in the 20s and 30s becomes, again, like the rest of the Dominion, is progressively more independent and declares itself to be a republic in 1949. So in the same year as, uh, in the same year, uh, um, Sorry, not the same year, actually, no, a couple of years after it, but, but already, you know, uh, um, you know, this is also a major indication, if you like, of, of, of uh, uh, um, Britain's sort of shrinking colonial presence. Um, so I'll say, yeah, it reaches the zenith in terms of its geographical extent of the First World War. The British like to boast, as I said earlier, as an empire in which the sun never set. And it should be noted that of all the kind of overseas colonial possessions, India was by far the most important. India was considered to be the jewel of the crown when it came to the British Empire. I should say, when we talk about India, today we're describing, um, you know, India plus Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. And then, of course, the British were also in, uh, uh, in possession of Burma, which today, of course, is Myanmar. Um, and yes, as I say, the Raj, India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. This was, you know, this was by far Britain's most important colony. The quotation here by Lord Curzon, who was Viceroy of India at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah, as long as we rule India, we are the greatest power in the world. If we lose it, we shall straight away drop to a third rate power. And yet... Uh, what is notable is that India is the first colony to go. So you have this paradoxical situation that the British, who are so attached to India, who believe that it's so important, when it comes to it, uh, India is the first colony, really, which the British actually relinquish. Um, as I said, though, Britain already experiencing a crisis of empire 
you know, even before the Second World War, this was especially acute in India, Palestine and Egypt. To some extent, I think you could actually uh, add Ireland to the list as well. Um, all these colonies basically contain strong nationalist movements, which were challenging British rule. Um, and in each of them, the British basically bestow a large measure of self-government. Um, so in Egypt, they create a royal family, uh, which, if you like, was being advised, in inverted commas, by the British. Um, in India, you know, the British reluctantly in the 1930s concede a fairly large measure of self-government. Um, one of those who were very much in opposition to this was Winston Churchill, but he was never, he was not in government in the 1930s, so he could do little to affect that. In Palestine, the British attempt to, to uh, partition uh, Palestine between giving giving the uh, creating a sort of Jewish homeland um, and a Palestinian. Uh, you know, and, and rump Palestinian state. So what today I suppose we would describe as a two state solution, but the British, um, you know, the British, like their successors, uh, fail to achieve a real resolution to that. In fact, Palestine becomes a massive sort of problem for the British in terms of policing it in the 1930s. Um, so as I say, even without the war, the Europeans would almost certainly have had to dismantle their empires. So this is the situation when the Second World War breaks out. Um, and as we noted, uh, during the war, the British established a very sort of close working relationship with the United States. This is the beginnings of the so-called special relationship. Um, you know, we talked about the fact that the, that the uh, uh, combined chiefs of staffs are created, you know, a committee composed of, of uh, British and American generals, Roosevelt and Churchill, work together extremely closely during the war. I think they meet something in um, approximately anyway, I can't remember the exact figure, but something around 12, 12 times they meet during the war. Um, and there's also this, I suppose, during the war, there's a sort of growing recognition on the British side that um, the United States is going to become a great power, probably even a superpower, uh, that America is going to have a profound influence globally and there's, a, and there's a general feeling, I think, in some quarters of the British establishment that perhaps the British could kind of pass on their own knowledge to the United States. You know, that the centuries which the British have been sort of running their own empire, um, that the Americans, if you like, could benefit from British expertise in this area. Foremost among the British politicians who are thinking along these lines is the future British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, who during the war was the British government's representative in North Africa. He works extremely closely with um, the American general, Eisenhower. And he says on one occasion to one of his colleagues, you know, he says, my dear Crossman, everybody was my dear to Macmillan, uh, you will find the Americans much like the Greeks found the Romans, great, big, vulgar, bustling people, more vigorous than we are, and also more idle, with more unspoilt virtues, but also more corrupt. And then he basically goes on to say that, you know, the, Brit the, the, the British will be the Greeks, helping the Americans run the new Pax Americana. Um, However, as I said, the empire, the British empire, becomes a major source of contention in terms of the Anglo-American relationship. Now, both sides recognise that they did not want to allow the empire, uh, British imperialism, to sort of derail the Anglo-American relationship during the war itself. But nonetheless, it was becoming increasingly apparent that the Americans expected that the British would actually withdraw from parts of their empire once the war had come to an end, especially India. Um, apparently, on one occasion, Churchill says this in his memoirs, apparently on one occasion, Roosevelt raised the issue of Indian independence with Churchill. Churchill's response was so forthright that Roosevelt did not raise it directly with Churchill again. Well, he might not have raised it directly with Churchill, but he was certainly raising it with plenty of other people. And it was becoming clear. I think Roosevelt even sends a sort of American commission to investigate India uh, and what was happening there. But Churchill, though, a die-hard imperial, imperialist um, and absolutely resolute in his view 
that the British were not going to dismantle their empire. There's a great quotation here. I think he says this in the House of Commons in 1942. Um, I have not become the king's first minister in order to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. Well, that may well have been the case, but ultimately Churchill was not going to be in a position to prevent the liquidation of the British Empire. In fact, when the British take the first significant steps towards decolonization, Churchill isn't in office, so Churchill is in no position to influence the process one way or the other. Another great quotation, I think I've taken this from Mazava's book, um, but Life magazine, so a very popular American magazine, periodical, saying in 1942, the one thing we are not fighting for is to hold the British Empire together in the light of what you're doing in India. How can you expect us to talk about principles and look our soldiers in the eye? So again, an indication of the sort of ideological clash here. Um, this was especially apparent, I think, among America's most senior generals who were decidedly suspicious about British intentions. Um, and uh, some of them sarcastically relabel SEAC, which stood for uh, the Southeast Asian Command, as being Save England's Asian co Colonies. Um, you know, there was this suspicion that, that the United States was being drawn into the war in the Pacific and in East Asia in order to, you know, in order to salvage Britain's colonies. Uh, in the region, which of course, you know, the Americans are sort of adamant. Should be said, it should be noted though, in terms of this sort of quotation from Life magazine, the British actually had quite a good riposte to this, in terms of, to this, if you like, um, um, uh, um, to this high handedness about principles. They could always point to the fact that the United States Army was segregated, um, that there was, you know, that. Uh, um, that white Americans and black Americans were separated, something which did, you know, which wasn't, which didn't actually take place in the uh, in 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 the British Empire. And actually, segregation actually becomes something of an issue when um, um, American soldiers are actually deployed in Britain during the war. You know, the uh, American generals say, "Well, you know, we want we would actually like uh, cafes." in Britain to be segregated as well. And, you know, the British say, well, hang on a minute, that's not our tradition. You know, we don't, you know, we don't do this in our country. So, yeah, there was more than an element of American hypocrisy, which was not lost on the British. Nonetheless, as I say, um, you know, there is this sort of clear ideological divide. OK, let's turn to India. Now, the story of Indian independence is extremely long and very complicated, and I cannot do it justice now. But so I'm just going to give a very, very simplified version. Um, they, but, you know, as I said, it's quite striking that India is the first colony to be granted independence, given the significance that the British attached to it. Um, and I think there's a, you know, I think there are several reasons for that, some of which I've already alluded to. But the other thing to note is that the British were already experiencing pretty acute difficulties in India long before the Second World War. Um, Congress had emerged to challenge British rule. Uh, Gandhi had obviously led mass protests, preaching nonviolent resistance, all the rest of it. So, excuse me, even before the war, the British, as I say, were already having, were already struggling to maintain their grip on India. Um, after the war, um, essentially, the pressure continues, but this is also coupled with increasing intercommunal violence between Indians and Muslims. And the British basically find themselves in the middle of this, of this community and struggling to maintain order. Again, it's a reflection of, of, if you like, how volatile the situation is within India and Britain's own relative weakness by this stage, that they are actually kind of struggling um, to contain the situation. And that in itself, I think, puts increasing pressure on British administrators to actually get out. You know, there's, there's this feeling that if they, if they stay for much longer, India will simply sort of explode and the British will, you know, will will find it very hard to sort of manage this situ situation. Another factor, though, that is, that is worth noting is that in 1945, a Labour government comes to power. It's socialist and therefore anti-colonial in its philosophy and ideology. 
Um, and yeah, that is significant, not because Labour politicians were passionately committed to decolonization. I don't think they were. I've already mentioned Ernest Bevan, who, who, who viewed the empire as a resource on which the British could potentially draw. Um, but when they are faced with the realities with the situation in India and elsewhere, I think psychologically it's a lot easier for Labour politicians to sort of let go of their empire. I suspect had Churchill still been in office um, in 1945, 46, 47, um, Churchill would have dug in in India and, you know, held on for as long as possible. As I say, when the Labour, you know, when Labour politicians ultimately recognise that India is a lost cause, as I say, it's psychologically easier for them to sort of relinquish uh, and to uh, and to plan for a British withdrawal. Um, so yeah, economic political realities ultimately ensure that India has to be granted independence. The way they go about that is that they appoint Lord Mountbatten, who was a member of the British royal family and who had been um, a you know, senior um, naval officer during, uh, du during the war. Mountbatten is appointed Viceroy of India. And as his brief, he is told that he is going to be the guy responsible for uh, uh, managing India's independence. Um, there's a great chapter on Mountbatten in, uh, written by um, uh, Andrew Roberts in a book called Eminent Churchillians. And it is really, really uh, corsicating in terms of his critique of Mountbatten's role in all of this. The one point that Roberts makes is that Mountbatten decides almost on a whim that the British have to get out as quickly as possible and he basically sets a deadline he said the british will be out of india by the 15th of august 1947 why the 15th of august you may ask simply because it is a two-year anniversary of the of the japanese surrender there was no more logic to it than that um, and that's important because it essentially meant that the indians uh, indian muslims and indian uh, uh, hindus knew that at that point, the British would be out. Um, and so that that has an important effect in terms of the negotiations and the dynamics under which uh, independence was going to be achieved. Ultimately, um, Indian Muslims under Jina basically insist that they want a separate independent state of their own. So ultimately, the political realities in India are such that uh, the British are forced, well, the British opt, this is, this is a classic sort of British solution to these sorts of things. The British opt to partition India in pretty much the same way as they had opted to partition uh, Ireland and then Palestine and then and Cyprus to cite yet another example. Um, but the frontier that they draw is proves to be remarkably controversial. And of course, we're still living with the consequences of that. One of the points Roberts makes in his book is that there was a general feeling, and I think the evidence now bears this out, that Mount Mountbatten was um, extremely biased towards the Indian Hindu population in terms of the actual final settlement. Um, so the frontier that is drawn up, as I say, is controversial. Um, the Pakistanis in particular feel that felt extremely hard done by. And then the British withdraw. And as I say, the final point there, India, uh, independence in India is accompanied by massacres, population displacement. Nobody knows quite how many people die. Almost certainly at least tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands. Uh, maybe even a couple of million. That's the kind of higher end of the estimates. Um, but essentially, the British withdrawal from India becomes the sort of model which they follow in other colonies as well. So you see something very similar happening in Palestine um, the following year, May 1948, when again the British basically unilaterally withdraw, hand the situation to the United Nations, and Israel, you know, the Jewish population there declare a state of Israel and what follows again is a lot of violence, the first in a succession of Arab-Israeli wars. Um, following year, the British withdraw from Burma, 
Um, interestingly, the you know, the government that comes to power in Burma is not interested in becoming part of the of, of British Commonwealth. The African colonies follows later. You know, Ghana, 1957. I've got there. Nigeria, 1960. Um, but most of the colonies become part of the Commonwealth. And I suppose what the British were hoping for in the late 1940s and 1950s was that the Commonwealth would become a kind of loose sort of confederation of states, perhaps still under some form of British leadership. I think there were aspirations to uh, to create a sort of wider Commonwealth trading bloc, although that never quite lives up to expectations. OK, so as I say, the British out of India by 1947, Palestine the following year. Um, of course, it's in these years that the Cold War itself begins to crystallise. And of course, that too begins to have quite a marked impact on the way the various uh, European countries go about decolonisation. It also obviously begins to have a marked influence on American attitudes to decolonisation. As we've noted during the Second World War and immediately after the Second World War, the Americans are expecting uh, the Europeans to sort of dismantle their empires. The fact, though, that many indigenous nationalist movements were also communist, this also begins to become a factor in American uh, considerations. Now, during the war, this isn't a problem because, of course, the Americans are allied with the, the Soviet Union. So supporting communists who were often fighting the Japanese in China and elsewhere, um, you know, that's not a problem during the war itself. By 1947, though, as anti-communist feeling begins to harden in the United States, um, that obviously begins to influence um, American attitudes. A great case in point is Vietnam. Um, in that, first of all, th during the war, and again, I think pretty much immediately after the war, the Americans are adamant that the French cannot return to Indochina. You know, obviously, J Indochina had been annexed by the Japanese during the war. There's no desire in the United States to see the French return. Um, and yet they do, partly with the support of the British. I think the British play quite an important role in, in, in assisting the French uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, um, um, reassert their control over the colonies. And as I say, the Americans basically want the French out of Indochina. Um, however, you know, 47, 48, Cold War begins and suddenly, as I say, attitudes in the American attitudes begin to change quite significantly. And suddenly there's a feeling that actually maybe the French um, should stay after all. Um, and in fact, this attitude changes to the extent that by the late 1940s, the Americans are basically bankrolling the French war effort in Indochina. Um, as I say, their policy of containment led America to oppose anti-colonial anti communist movements throughout the Third World. Um, you see something similar as well in Malaya in the 1950s. Malaya is actually interesting because it's the one, one of the very few examples of a successful counterinsurgency campaign which the British lead. And ultimately, that, that becomes the model which... Uh, um, you know, which uh, um, the Americans attempt to follow in Vietnam um, a few years later. Um, should also be said, I mean, in the 1960s, a sort of division um, emerges or, or um, a division of labor, I should say, emerges between the British and the Americans in, in Asia, where, you know, basically the British take responsibility for Malaysia, Singapore, those sorts of areas, whilst the Americans uh, become engaged, um, increasingly engaged in Vietnam. Okay, um, we consider the British. Let's we should also consider briefly uh, French decolonization. Um, France withdraws from its Middle Eastern colonies or Near Eastern colonies in 1951. So I mentioned here Tunisia, Morocco, Tunisia obviously North uh, North Africa, Morocco, North Africa, Syria, and Lebanon. Um, Algeria and Indo Indochina are more problematic, though, uh, for, from the French. Um, I've probably got these in the wrong order, so I'll do Indochina first. We just mentioned uh, we just mentioned the fact that you know that essentially the Americans support the French war effort from the late 1940s. In fact, as I say, there. Um, 
the war costs the French um, more money than they actually receive in martial aid. But as I say, you know, um, uh, and obviously Korea is the sort of turning point. Uh, th this is the moment, I suppose, where America's containment strategy becomes globalized. You have uh, NSC 68, National Security Council document 68, which basically argues containment uh, is not enough to follow a containment policy in Europe, but you have to do uh, you have to do that elsewhere as well. So Korea is the moment, if you like, where the Cold War becomes globalized. Obviously, Korea, East Asia, um, in close proximity to what's happening in Southeast Asia. So the Americans want to maintain the French war effort in Indochina. The trouble is that it comes to a pretty um, ignominious end in 1954 when the French are defeated at a place called Dien Bien Phu. Um, essentially, a you know a French garrison comes under sustained attack by uh, Indochinese forces. Um, and it ends in catastrophe. It ends in a it ends in a French French retreat. Incidentally, it's quite interesting because in in 1954, the American military consider some kind of intervention in Indochina in order to try and uh, save the French. But they ultimately conclude that it would be a bad idea to send military forces to Indochina in, into uh, into Vietnam. You know, they look at it, realize it's basically a big jungle, very hard to fight in. Um, so they, you know, they refrain from that. Instead, a political settlement is reached in 1954 in Geneva, in which they, in which Vietnam is going to be divided. There is a communist North Vietnam, a southern uh, um, non-communist um, uh, um, South Vietnam, um, with a sort of puppet uh, puppet government um, in place there. The Geneva Accords. The, the, the agreement of Geneva basically also stipulates that there will be elections held in Vietnam, although these never take place simply because the Americans recognize that the communists are actually pretty popular. And if they were to be held, then the communist government would almost certainly come to power. Uh, so that's the situation in Vietnam. And of course, effectively, the Americans uh, find themselves increasingly supporting the South Vietnamese government, which is sort of waging its own insurgency campaign against North, North Vietnamese activities. The Americans start sending military advisors to uh, Vietnam in the late 1950s, more follow, um, and obviously by the 60s, particularly after Kennedy's death, there's, you know, there's, a, there's an ongoing debate about whether or not Kennedy would have ramped up the war effort in uh, in Vietnam. It's hard to know one way, one way or the other. Um, but after Kennedy's death, President Johnson takes this fateful decision to actually send more and more troops to fight in Vietnam in an effort to try and in, in an effort to try and win the war there, which obviously ultimately ends pretty badly for the United States. Okay, so that's Indochina. Let's also quickly mention Algeria, uh, which is the other major colony that the French uh, uh, um, um, government. I should say actually one of the reasons why both in both Indochina and in Algeria, the French run into difficulties is that in both countries, there are large white French speaking settler populations. Um, so Algeria Francais, as, uh, as, as was known, this idea that Algeria was part of France, that, well, you know, that had a, quite a strong grip in French politics in the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, but the French find themselves fighting a war there. In this case, it's not against communists, but against uh, Algerian nationalists and Islamic groups in uh, in uh, in Algeria. And the war become is pretty nasty, brutal, and ultimately destabilizes the French government. The French, you know, French as in France itself. Um, the French become increasingly divided between those who support the war and those who are against, to the point at which France is virtually on the brink of civil war in the late 1950s. Um, and ultimately, the French government collapses in the face of this huge crisis, you know, that the, France almost reaches the point at which 
um, the French military stage a coup. Again, this is 1958, so France is now already a member of the European community. And again, it's kind of almost impossible to envisage this today, you know, of, a, of, of the French seizing, the French military seizing power in Paris. But, you know, that was the situation. Anyway, uh, Charles de Gaulle invited to assume power. De Gaulle, who'd sort of been in the wilderness of French politics in the 1950s, is invited to uh, come back. Um, he does so on the condition that he's allowed to rewrite the French constitution and he establishes the today's Fifth Republic, which puts an awful lot of power in the hands of the French president. And then after a lot of sort of toing and froing, I mean, de Gaulle himself was studiedly sort of ambiguous in terms of his exact intentions. He sort of indicates late 50s that he, you know, that he favours um, trying to fight, trying to hold on to Algeria in some way. Um, but ultimately, he proves to be pragmatic and much to the consternation of many in the French military and beyond the French military, de Gaulle decides that France is going to have to withdraw from Algeria and a settlement is finally reached in 1962. Um, if you've ever seen the film or read the novel, actually, The Day of the Jackal, that goes into some of you know goes into some of the events surrounding this and the fact that uh, you know there were plenty of uh, you know, there was an organised opposition to De Gaulle who 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 was seriously plotting to to kill him. Um, okay, so Algeria and into China, you know, in both countries, you know, the France, France are drawn into two rather nasty, bloody, brutal wars. So de the you know, decolonization does not go particularly well for the French in those in those areas. A few others we can mention in passing. Um, Holland uh, attempts to try and restore its position in the East Indies, uh, today's Indonesia. Uh, East Indies particularly important in terms of their oil reserves and, and various other sort of quite significant economic resources. Um, like the French in Indochina, the Dutch are sort of kicked out during the war by by by, by the Japanese. Um, but as I said, they attempt to reassert their control, but it does not go well. I had a Dutch student a few years ago tell me that that um, the, you know the insurgency in the late forties um, is sort of Holland's equivalent to Vietnam in the United States. You know, it's still very much remembered there. Belgium forced to withdraw from the Congo in 1960. Um, I mean, Belgium's colonial rule, e even by European standards, was extraordinarily kind of exploitative and quite brutal. Um, but Belgium withdraws from the Congo in 1960, um, immediately resulting in a sort of civil war, power struggle, Katanga, a, French, a, 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 a province attempts to secede and all the rest of it. So they leave behind a particularly messy situation. And of course, the Congo is still sort of living with a legacy of Belgium rule, even today. You know, Congo is, 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 uh, is still one of the world's poorest countries. Um, Portugal, Angola and Mozambique will also gain independence in 1975. Spain also relinquishes its uh, control over its colonies. Um, so certainly by the 1970s, the European empires have more or less been dismantled. Um, Britain still has one or two islands dotted around the map, still does today, but nothing really substantial. I suppose the last major act of British decolonization was, was the withdrawal from uh, Hong Kong in 1998, when you know, the British uh, lease there came to, came to an end. OK, we'll finish off with just a quick consideration of the Suez crisis in 1956. Um, interesting because in some ways it's the last sort of British imperial campaign. Uh, and also because of what it tells us about the state of transatlantic relations in this period. Again, it's quite a long and complicated story. and um, pretty sure there are a couple of publications on the reading list which go into it so i'm not going to give a very detailed account of it now um but i will just quickly sort of consider some of the main consequences we've got here a cover of time magazine and on the cover is colonel gamal nasser the egyptian leader who comes to power in the mid-1950s um basically the british withdrawal from india um, 
after the Second World War, um, but they maintain an important influence in the country, not least when the British withdraw, they sign a treaty in which, uh, which stipulates that if the Suez Canal is ever threatened militarily by another power, the British had the right to return to the Canal Zone, which was basically a large military base, which uh, uh, um, you know, or a network of military bases which uh, which were located along the canal. 1952, the monarchy which the British had left behind was overthrown, a military government comes to power and Nasser uh, emerges as the new Egyptian leader. He is an, a nationalist, incredibly popular, quite a charismatic, in fact a very charismatic figure, um, has a lot of popular support within Egypt and the part, last point, so, you know, last British military forces withdraw from Egypt in 1954. So that's the situation. As I say, Canal Treaty signed in 1954, which, as I say, uh, gives Britain the right to deploy military forces if the Canal Zone is threatened. And the crisis begins when in 1955 Egypt purchases some arms from Czechoslovakia. This is taken as an indication that the Egyptian government is now starting to lean more towards the communist bloc. There are fears that maybe Nasser has communist sympathies. In reality, actually, Nasser was simply just trying to play uh, one superpower off against the other. Uh, Nasser had no real sympathy for communism. In fact, I think Egyptian communists had actually been arrested by, by Nasser. Nonetheless, the Americans react quite badly to this. Um, and they retaliate by cancelling some aid they had promised for the construction of the Aswan Dam, which was basically an Egyptian prestige project, um, a dam which was going to be constructed on the River Nile. NASA responds to this by deciding to nationalise the Suez Canal in 1956, um, and he he wanted to use the revenues that the canal generated from the tolls that it charged ships which were passing through the canal. NASA wanted to use these revenues in order to finance the dam project. Um, the problem with this is that the British and the French were the major shareholders in the canal. So effectively, the British and the French were losing their control over the canal and both governments react extremely badly to this. Eden, who had Anthony Eden, who had recently become British Prime Minister, who had succeeded from uh, from uh, um, Churchill. In fact, he, you know, Eden had been waiting to take over for a long time. If any of you have seen the Netflix series The Crown, it goes into some of this in some detail. Um, Eden, as I say, kind of waiting to take over. Finally, he does so, and he's faced with this huge foreign policy crisis. And I think it's fair to say Eden's reaction is almost kind of hysterical. You know, he can't believe what NASA has done. He compares NASA to uh, um, Hitler. Uh, which again is significant because Eden had been very much in the anti-appeasement camp in British politics in the in, in, in the 1930s and decides that the British have to respond forcefully to uh, to NASA's decision. The problem, though, is that when NASA does this, the British simply don't have military forces to send to Egypt. I mean, I think Eden summons his generals and says, you know, I want to, you know, I, 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 I want to start bombing Egypt. And the generals sort of look sheepishly at one another and have to tell Eden that it's actually going to take some time for them to uh, assemble a force. In the meantime, the Americans try and find a sort of diplomatic solution to the crisis. I think a conference of shareholders is convened and they discuss compensation and things like that. The British and the French sort of go through, through the motions in order to keep the Americans happy, whilst in secret, and one of the things I always say about the Suez crisis is that this is one of the very few conspiracy theories um, in relation to history, which actually is correct. You know, there was a conspiracy because in secret, the British and the French governments decide plot in conjunction with the Israelis to basically try and overthrow NASA. And they come up with a plan um, in which Israel says that 
they would launch some kind of strike against Egypt and that the British and the French would use this as a pretext to deploy their military forces into Egypt. A treaty is drawn up at a French chateau, Sevres, much to Eden's horror, because he, uh, you know, when he finds out the British diplomats have signed this treaty, he can't believe that they have done this orders them to go immediately back to Paris to retrieve all the comment or to retrieve all copies of the treaty. He wants them burnt simply because he did not want any evidence of this sort of collusion. Um, but they fail to get all the copies. A, a, few, a few years later, a copy does actually turn up, which basically proves, as I say, this sort of conspiracy which had taken taken place. Um, anyway, October 1956, uh, the plan goes ahead. The Egyptians launch their connect launch their strike. The British and the French send out their military forces. The problem though is that they haven't consulted the United States. So the Americans are kept entirely in the dark. They don't know what the British and the French are planning. Um, so the intervention, the Anglo-French military intervention comes as something of a surprise and a shock for the Americans. The British and the French simply expect that the Americans will support them. Um, so, you know, they react with consternation when the United States comes out in opposition and says, no, we are not going to support this, and says very clearly that they will go to the United Nations and immediately table a resolution uh, um, demanding a halt to military operations, which they do, and which the British and the French governments obviously veto in the UN Security Council. The problem, though, is that the British need American financial support and they also need American oil to to uh, maintain the operation, both of which uh, are suspended. The Americans essentially tell the British that to halt their campaign or, uh, or, or uh, um, and essentially say, you know, we will not, you know, we will not give you the financial support. All the oil that you need. So this is a really good example, I think, of sort of economic coercion. In the meantime, the Soviets also sort of intervene. Khrushchev, with typical bluster, threatens to fire missiles at London and Paris, um, which have no real kind of bearing on the crisis, except um, it, 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 it sort of boosts Soviet prestige in the Middle East. So when the British and the French finally do capitulate and withdraw, um, you know, many people think that the Soviets uh, had played quite an important role, although, as I say, the reality was rather different. Um, but it ends in a huge sort of political crisis. Um, Anthony Eden sort of basically has a, has a, has a uh, sort of collapse, emotional collapse in office. He has to go off and to, to the Caribbean to recuperate uh, when he eventually does return to Britain beginning of 1957. He's, there's a sort of cabinet coup against him and he's forced to resign. Um, a couple of further things to say to conclude. First of all, as I say, first point that it demonstrates American power and European weakness. The fact that the United States, when it came to it, could basically uh, um, scupper the Anglo-American uh, operation. Um, just to quickly address the question, you know, why do the Americans not um, support the British? Well, maybe we'll talk a little bit about a bit more detail about that in the, in, in the seminar. But as I say, uh, there are several reasons, and I think it's worth uh, uh, worth giving some consideration to that. So um, yeah, I think I'll leave that to discuss in our uh, in a, in our seminar in a couple of days' time. Um, However, I think one thing that is worth noting is that the British and the French with sort of draw rather different conclusions. Um, from the French perspective, this is an act of betrayal that, you know, in their hour of need, the Americans were not, you know, were not forthcoming with assistance. Um, so the French, you know, the lesson the French take away from this particular crisis is that you can't trust the Americans, which has, you know, significant ramifications when uh, uh, certainly after de Gaulle becomes president uh, from 59 onwards. Uh, for the British, the British almost draw the opposite conclusion, and that is that you kind of have to trust the Americans, or at least, you know, the big mistake was not taking Washington into Britain's confidence. Um, so after Eden resigns, uh, Mac Howard Macmillan comes into office. Uh, 
like Churchill, Macmillan has an American mother. Um, and, you know, like Churchill, Macmillan is 100% committed to the Anglo-American relationship. So he sees it as his mission in 1957 to try and restore the relationship. Um, that is also somewhat easier because Eisenhower at this time is president and the two men know, have known each other for a long time, worked together during the Second World War. Um, so both of them go about repairing the special relationship and they do have some success in that area. Um, but as I say, the lesson that the British take away from all of this is that, yes, you have to work closely with the United States. And what you see after Suez is I think that the British make damn sure that whenever that if they ever have to undertake a similar kind of initiative, that this time they will have American support. And I suppose you can see this in another colonial war that the United sorry, that the British fight in 1982, where Margaret Thatcher dispatches um, a naval task force to the South Atlantic in order to recover the Falkland Islands, which had been seized by the Argentinians. Um, Thatcher makes damn sure that she has Ronald Reagan's backing uh, when she, you know, when she uh, dispatches the task force. You know, ultimately the Americans. I mean, there is some sort of um, division within the Reagan administration between those who are sort of more reasonably sympathetic to Argentina, others who were more uh, more supportive of the British, but ultimately, as I say, Reagan comes down in favour 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 of the British, and to some extent, that is a reflection of, of 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 the diplomacy that the British sort of undertake during that crisis. Okay, and I think I will conclude on that point.